So the reason we're here is um, Andy started a, a company around wine a little while ago. And beer. And beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't go so well. And one of the things that we're both quite passionate about is that in Africa, uh, and particularly in South Africa, there's a very traditional, uh, almost masochistic um, attitude towards failure. And we don't talk about it enough. Whereas if you go to a lot of other markets in the world, failure is celebrated. And in fact, people are encouraged to fail as quickly as possible. Because by failing, you learn. So what we thought we'd do is talk a little bit about failure and around the stuff that Andy experienced so that everybody else can learn. Right? So if every single one of you takes away one lesson from Andy, he's hoping that he can save you a lot of pain that he had to go through. Right? So in many ways, it's paying it forward as well as being a little bit cathartic. So, I think I'm over the catharsis now, now it's just sad. Now it's just sad, yeah. <laughs> But that's why we're here. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and run through a lot of the basics very quickly and then encourage everybody to ask questions. Okay, so, and the thing to bear in mind and what we really enjoyed about doing this in Cape Town was that there were some really good questions. And I want to say to everybody here, there's no question you can't ask at all. Okay, there's two people that Andy doesn't want to mention, so those people are off limits. But you can ask any other question you want for both of us. And we'll try and answer the best way we can. And they're both wankers, so you don't need to know about them. You don't anyway. need to know them, and you don't want to know them anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what Gareth said, there's, there's a lot of ego in the startup world at the moment. Um, it's kind of the only thing Aaron Marshall and I disagree on. <laughs> you know, he thinks it's, it's all humble pie. But uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ego, and not a lot of people are telling the truth. Uh, and one of the reasons I wrote that blog post, which kind of did the rounds and, and caused this series of talks, was because I wanted to finally be honest about what the startup ecosystem looks like, what it's like to raise money, what it's like to run a business, where I fucked it up, and there were plenty of times, what I did well, and there was plenty of that as well. Um, so I would much prefer that we talked for five minutes and then answered questions for 55 minutes. Um, that is much, much better. So at any stage, we're not going to ask you, just get up, line up, we'll interrupt what we're doing, and we'll answer questions. Yeah. That'll make this much more cool. So we were discussing this in the car this morning. What we're going to do very quickly is a brief intro for both of us, just so you guys kind of get a little bit of context, so you know that we're not wankers. Um, secondly, well. Andy's going to talk a little bit about his experience. Um, so that's the, that's the what. Um, and then... We've we, done the why. Yeah, we've done the why. And then we're going to go into questions. Yeah. All right, so do you want to... Shall I start and then you start? Or? You start. All right, so my background is... Um, I st my, the last company I started was in 2007, 2008. Grew that to... 400,000 users in 220 countries in 17 languages in six months. And then sold that to a company in, in Israel called MyHeritage, went to work for them for a year uh, in Tel Aviv in London, exited that business, and then started another one, which has been the fucking hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and we're now at a point where we're running at about, I don't know, 120 million a year. We're an e-commerce business focused on furniture. Um, I've raised around 80 million rand so far in rand terms. Uh, for the business, I'm currently doing a fundraising at the moment. If I don't do the fundraising, I'm going to hit the wall and the business is going to collapse. If I do do the fundraising, I'm probably going to get my payday one day, which would be fantastic. So I've kind of been through the same process that Andy's gone through. I'm probably just a little bit further along, and I've made many of the same mistakes. Um, on top of that, I do Tech for Africa. So I've kind of got both things going at the same time. And we've nearly hit the wall with Tech for Africa at least five times. So it, it's been quite emotional in many respects. So when Andy and I started talking about this, I just started ticking off boxes in my own head about the stuff that I could identify with. And I said, hey, let's put, our, let's put it out there. So that's my background. And I'm going to be able to ask Andy questions that you guys probably wouldn't be able to ask because you might not understand how cap table works. Or you might not understand how to finance a business. Or you might not understand how to start something. So I'm going to ask those questions because those are the questions you should be asking yourself if you want to build a business. OK. So my background, um, I did my first startup at age 19 at UCT, and I've been asked about this multiple times at Tech for Africa, so I will just quickly tell the story as how I can say I was sued by Robert Mugabe in my bio. Um, it's a very simple story, and we, we dramatized it a little bit, but uh, back in 99, we used to make these little political games. I mean, Flash didn't even exist back then, so this was like whatever was pre-Flash which was ugly, ugly. But you could play these games in a browser, and we had this game called Squirt Diesel at Robert Mugabe. You'd just done something really fucked up with Actually, diesel imports. Actually, I remember that. Do you I remember, remember playing it? that at Vits, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you squirt diesel down his throat as his face jumps around the screen, and if you squirt diesel down his throat enough, he explodes in a big fireball. And we got a cease and desist letter from the Zimbabwean government, which you can spin into, 
I was sued by Robert Mugabe. Um, that was an interesting business. My partner had a heart attack at the age of 24, died. I got sued by his mom, and that was five years of my life. Bush gone. Uh, I did five years in a digital agency, two and a half years at F&B, doing some really, really cool stuff there on the digital side. Um, three years in the startup, in real time wine and, and my beer, and uh, now uh, desperately seeking relevance, trying to find out what the fuck to do next. That's, yeah. That's so my I mean, here's one of the things about Tech for Africa, which I just want to plug very, very quickly, is when I was listening to Aaron's talk earlier, I don't know if he's in the audience at all, I've got my glasses on, I can't see him. Aaron, are you here? There you are. He's, he's, he's headed back to the airport. Okay, so I was listening to Aaron's talk and it, it rang so true with me. You know, what's your passion? Why are you here? And that's something that Andy's trying to figure out at the moment, having earned these stripes. And I so, think, you know, one other cool story just for the Tech for Africa circle is um, Real Time Wine started because it won the Samsung Ignite pitch competition at Tech for Africa 2011. Yeah. So three years later, here we are. Here we are. All right, so is that enough of an intro for everybody? Anything else we should go through? All right, cool. So, so anyone brave enough to ask a question pre we go through anything? Yeah. Start lining up so everyone can hear. After this question, I'll then give you a, a kind of a very brief rundown. So just before you ask, um, how many people interacted with Real Time Wine in some way while it was live? Yes, that's like at least 3%. Woo. <laughs> I did too as well, I remember. Thank you. Uh, uh, Andy, yeah, yeah. I, did, I used Real Time Wine. I actually really liked it. Thank you, man. One question, and well, a couple of questions. The first one, and it might be quite hard to answer, were you surprised to win the, uh, the pitching contest at Tech for Africa a couple of years ago, or three years ago, four years ago? Before he answers that, I just want to answer, I wasn't surprised at all, because Andy's a very good presenter. Yeah. And yeah. pitching is largely about presentation skills more than anything else. 100%. And I wasn't surprised at all, and I actually thought that it was probably the right person to win, yeah. but he might have a different view. Yeah, I, you know, without sounding like an arrogant twat, that I'd been doing public speaking, geez, for like, I don't know, eight years, nine years. Um, so it's the one big thing I think people pitching in this country are missing is public speaking skills. Um, you know, knowing how to construct a deck. Just the fact that you can't have more than 10 words on a deck or the audience is reading the slide and not listening to you. Those are things that I've just been able to practice over 10 years. So as long as I could tell a cool story, and, and that was always one of the amazing things about Real Time Wine, was that it was, a, it was this David and Goliath story of the, the normal everyday wine drinker taking on the critics and telling them to bugger off because we can all rate wine. Um, and it was a beautiful story, and I think that's probably one of the reasons um, that we won. I was in the crowd, in the audience, watching that, that uh, pitch, and I, I, you did great. I, I honestly thought your pitch was really good. But Thanks. even from then, I wondered some of the other businesses that were being pitched, the, how you were going to monetize. And I think that's possibly where you, you, kept, you came unstuck. Yeah, yeah. Stick I mean, around. That's that, that's a great question. So let me let me do this. Let's get this straight into it. Yeah. I will. Um, let me give you a quick outline of what it was, because there were only you know three percent of the audience who, who interacted with it, um, and then I'll I'll answer that question. I'll take you quickly through the four revenue models that we tested, uh, and we tested. I say we, it was kind of I, that's a different question, you can ask that. Um, so real-time wine was basically the high concept pitch. I, I'm a huge believer in you need to understand what your high concept pitch is. If you can't say what your business is in one sentence, you're doomed from the start. And this was TripAdvisor for wine. Okay? It had a much bigger vision, but essentially we were trying to solve three problems in the wine industry. Wine industry was a start. Um, we started there because wine is a high engagement product. So people drink wine any, you know, anywhere between one and seven times a week. Um, and there are three major problems. One is you drink great wine at a restaurant or mate's house, you forget what it's called the next day. Everyone has that problem. They nod their heads, yes, yes, yes. Uh, two is 85% of wine in this country is bought in a supermarket, 85%, and it is the worst buying experience ever. You walk into the wine aisle, everyone just shuts down. Ugh. I'll buy the orange one for 40 bucks because that's all I know. Um, and then three is that if you were even vaguely interested in wine and wanted to try and get something better than your 40 buck crap, um, r the wine world writes in this language that no one else understands. They're a bunch of pretentious snobs, mostly. Uh, and I wanted to try, try and you know, introduce that power to the people thing. There was a bigger idea behind the scenes, and I think it's why I managed to raise investment. And I think it's still a clever idea. I just think my timing was probably three years off. Is that we have a phone with us now wherever we are. And there was a particular moment that I was interested in, that was the moment of consumption. So the moment that you are using a product, you have a phone with you. And I wanted to trap that moment of consumption. Like Google has trapped the moment of relevance, 
you're searching for hotels, it's a, a good time to show you ads about hotels. Um, I wanted to trap the moment of consumption. And if I owned that moment, there should be amazing things that I could do around grabbing data, building engagement layers, personalizing e-commerce experiences, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the startup. Um, it raised... Whoa, uh, can yeah. I pause you there? Yeah. Because I want to go okay. through... Yeah, should yeah. we do the revenue models or do you have another question? No. Is everyone happy with the revenue models so far? Well, that wasn't the revenue models. Uh, well, I mean, that's so how are you going to create? Yeah. Okay, so go through that some more. Okay. And, and then you can ask some questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there were four. Um, where are you sitting? Yeah. Get closure, man. There we go. Um, there were four revenue models. Okay, revenue model number one. I knew that B2C was really tough in South Africa. I also knew that I probably hadn't raised enough money to point internationally. We can get into that. So you had to be B2B. And real time, I didn't look like a, a B2B player, but it actually was. We were trying to build a platform that we could plug into retailers' um, loyalty programs. So think Woolworths Rewards, uh, Pick and Pay Smart Shopper. Okay? So if we, can, we built an engagement layer, essentially, for all the products that you were buying in those retail stores, because that's where the market was. 85% of the market was in Pick and Pay and Woolworths. Um, so we wanted to sell this as a software as a service platform into a pick and pay or into a Woolworths. Then they can you know, get this amazing data layer about what their customers are actually doing about their products or with their products, where they're consuming them, how often they're consuming them, when they're consuming them, and then a qualitative and quantitative ranking of what that experience was like. And, you know, theoretically, that data is gold. And that was revenue model number one. We were probably too early. You know, if I look in hindsight, Willie's Pick and Pay Macro, all those guys, they only got e-commerce vaguely right this year. We were talking to them in 2012. And they, you know, they loved the idea. It went right down to kind of final round discussions with all of them. And then eventually it all just petered out because they didn't have an e-commerce base even. You know, they were trying to get onto this e-commerce wagon, not worry about you know, big data layers on top, of their, on top of their smart shopper program. Either that or I'm a, I'm a shitty salesperson. I'd, I'd like to think I'm an okay salesperson. Revenue model number two, and this is an interesting one, is to sell the data. You know, we were the only people in the country, and I'm pretty sure we still are, even though the data is out of date now, with category data across wine and beer. Okay, and by category data, I mean across the entire category. So Niederberg will have lots of data about Niederberg, but they won't have lots of data about the competitors. Okay, and it's basically survey data. And this was a huge, huge, huge lesson for me because you know, I sat with SAB, um, and they were the big sponsors of, of my beer, and I sat with their trade marketing guys, and we were looking at a really, really simple data representation. It was a word cloud of one of their competitor beers, uh, Darling Brew Bone Crusher. Okay? It's just a word cloud of words people used when they had a positive experience and words people used when they had a ne negative experience. And these guys sat back and they went, wow, that's a taste profile. Now I know exactly which SAB products to target to the people who don't like Darling Brew Bone Crusher. It's the coriander that they don't like, or it's the citrus that they don't like. Therefore, they will like this SAB product. Still, they couldn't use it. I saw research companies wet their pants when they saw the amount of category-wide data that I had. They couldn't sell it. So building this enormous data set is only good if you can actually sell it to someone. And it turned out that I couldn't sell it to someone. Revenue model number three, advertising. You've got to be so careful of advertising-based models. They need enormous scale to work. Um, that was lesson number one. Lesson number two in the advertising revenue model is that don't try and get media companies to buy ads that they don't understand or that aren't the norm in their industry. So our media industry is a, is a little bit behind, in my, in my opinion, because all we pretty much do is block bookings of banner ads. Okay, and then there's search and PPC, and that's it. I invented some of the cleverest, in, in my opinion, ad mechanics. You know, I could geo-target ads um, promoting supermarket wine on your way home for a supermarket that was on that route. Okay? I could serve you customized messaging when you were drinking a particular wine. So you were drinking a Warwick Three Cape Ladies. I could give you fun facts about that. I could give you food pairings. I could give you a voucher to go and buy that food at Woolies, all to that specific wine. Okay, but now here's the here's the kicker: How many people are drinking Warwick Three Cape Ladies this evening that own smartphones that are using my app? Let's catch that just now. Three. <laughs> so what was revenue number four? And revenue number four was affiliate sales. And once again, that's a really hard lesson in scale. 
So first six emails we sent out to an untrained base, we moved 100,000 rands worth of wine. Now that sounds like a good number. 7.5% affiliate commission, I made 7,500 rand. Woo fucking who. Like, you can't even pay a salary on that. Yeah. And so th those were four revenue models that we tested really, really hard. And it ends up that the only way to make money in the wine industry is to sell wine. And that's not the greatest business. <laughs> Low margin, high stress, not enough wine. OK, so everyone got any questions on that so far? If you do, just come up to the microphone. All right, so let's start getting into the, the kind of meat and potato stuff. So how much did you raise? I raised, um, it's interesting because I, you know, my investors asked me not to reveal this during the life cycle of the startup. And I think that's also indicative of one of the huge problems we have is that yeah. you know, either people are getting screwed or they're not getting screwed or there's not enough confidence. Um, but there's, there's reasons why people aren't talking about this stuff and they need to. So I raised 500,000 Rand on a 2.5 million Rand valuation. Um, so let's just pause you there. So just yeah. for everybody, if you're thinking about that, the maths you should be doing is you raised half a million. Half a million. On a two and a half pre, right, which means that your post is three million, which means you gave away? No, that was a, pre, that was a post money valuation. Okay, so your pre was actually two million. Pre was two, right. post was 2.5. So you gave away 20%. 20%. So effectively, you gave away 20% of his company in the first fundraising of half a million. Okay? Yep. Correct. All right, so here's the killer question for me. How much does the developer cost monthly in South Africa? A lot more than that. So I did the math. I mean, and you know, this this also leads into how you how you build these startups and some of the choices I had to make because I outsourced mine. Um, Presence, which doesn't exist anymore, interestingly enough, really? they did. Yeah, you know, they closed. You're kidding? Yeah. Wow. Prime Media. I don't think it was their focus. Yeah. Because they were a Prime Media company. So I did the I did the cigarette box maths on this. Okay. And I went, okay, let's pretend that I okay I'm building an app now. I need an iPhone app. I need an Android app. Now, people who code in iPhone and Android usually can't design, and a guy who codes on iPhone doesn't usually code on Android and, and vice versa. So, you so now you need three people. You have three people. Plus a designer, yourself. that, 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 and yourself. Okay. And that's the minimum of 200 well, km Let's month. pretend that they're all living with mommy and I managed to screw them on salary, and I got them for 30K, which is like ludicrous. Maybe in Cape Town, when they're young, 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 not in Joburg. But let's just pretend. Okay? So that's 30K times 4, 120K. Then offices, uh, general admin, that kind of stuff. Let's say that's 130K, 140K, and some marketing, 200K. So how long can I, how much runway do I have in 500K? So if you've done the maths, has anyone done the back of the envelope maths on that yet? Right, effectively, he's got like two months. Yeah, I've got right? two months. So in my ecosystem in London, people are raising money for like a year, year and a half, right? That, that's kind of what you need to get to the first kind of metric point. He's just raised money and it's given him two months. What the fuck can you achieve in two months? Right? It's With kind the of like best efforts and the best will in the world, you'd have to invent something so stratospherically viral <laughs> that it would allow you to raise more money in the next 30 days. And even if you do raise money, it's going to take you like two months or three months anyway. So you're dead. So in my view, that was the first mistake. And I think and you take that on the chin. You know, I know why it happened. I mean, at the time, and this is one of the reasons this whole startup story has got so much um, kind of momentum and, and press and people have talked about it, is at the time that was a fairly, you know, it was a fairly big raise with fairly high profile investors. It was Michael Yordan and, um, and Mike Rackliff who owns Warwick and Villafonte. Um, and I know why I couldn't raise anymore because it was a high risk business in a tiny market and no one was going to put the, the funds in in this country to allow me to point internationally. So why should they put in millions and millions and millions? It's, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. I probably couldn't go as quick as I could have, and I probably couldn't have hired a team as early as I would, would have wanted to. But equally, if I was investing, I also would have put in the same kind of amount. I think that was a good amount for the bet at the time. Yeah. You know, the average round, average angel investment round, say two, three years ago, was about 500. I think we're getting closer to about a million. So the situation is getting better. The outliers are raising 1.5 on, on angel rounds. But I'd say on average, it's probably getting close to a million. And a million, if you're clever with a, with a two founder team, one of whom can code, you can go for a year. Yeah. So, let, so there's two things that are important here. The one thing you haven't mentioned that, that I know is that you didn't pay yourself very well. If at all, well, for a long didn't pay time. At all, for so, three years. <laughs> so for three years, he didn't pay himself, right? So in fact, on, I put money in. <laughs> on, on one hand, he's he's not paying himself. He's putting his own cash in. He's got one foot in the startup, another foot in the corporate world, 
and he's trying to build books, this yeah. thing, right? So we have, I have this notion of burn the ships. If you're truly going to commit to something, you've actually got to burn all the ships. Otherwise, you're never really going to commit to it. You're always going to be half in, half out. And I think that was the first thing. And I think, secondly, if you don't pay yourself a decent salary, you don't actually have a good idea whether the business is survivable or not, because it's not a real situation, right? You have to pay yourself a salary, because if the company can't afford you, it's not a business, right? It's a hobby. So it's, an, it's an unrealistic picture it's an unrealistic of what picture. the business actually costs to run. Yeah. And the longer you don't pay yourself, the harder it is to start paying yourself. Yeah. I mean, by year two, I was making such bullshit excuses as, oh, crikey, you know, it's going to cost me now 20 grand to go and register for PAYE and do all the admin that's required from an accounting perspective. I might as well just not pay myself for another six months and see what I can do. But what Gareth was also referring to is this idea of, and again, you know, I have to said that there is no right or wrong answer here. Sometimes you're forced into a situation like, like I was in this instance. You have two options. One is the one foot in, one foot out approach, and one is the burn the ships approach. Okay? So burn the ships is literally you remove absolutely every distraction and every revenue stream you have so that the only possible outcome is success or failure of the venture that you're focusing on. And it does amaz amazing things to remove distractions, which is a really important, important part of startup life. Um, most startups battle in this country because they just get too distracted. Um, and so it was let, a theme. Let's just pause there. So how many of you are building a product? Put your hands up. Okay. If you are building a product, keep your hands up. All right. How many of you run some kind of consulting agency service type business? Put your hands down. That's... All right. That's fucking... That's, that's hardcore, right? So put your hands back up. So everyone look around. Put your hands up if you're building a product. All right. So these are the people that are you know, putting, putting their life on the line to build a product. All right, now, if you've got some other kind of income stream coming in, put your hands down. See what happens there? There's three Four. to five people that have actually burnt the ships. Right? Now, that tells me a lot about how difficult it is to raise money here and how difficult it is to get a product. And I believe that bootstrapping was the only way to do things for a very long time. And I burnt 30, 40,000 pounds of my own money in 2010 trying to figure out how to make everything work. And what I realized is that actually I made the best decisions when my back was against the wall. Because that's the only way you can think clearly about what the real things are that you need to do. Um, and I think you reach that point and you try to extend it for as long as possible. Yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing I think I did really well was I showed my investors that I would do absolutely anything to give that company as much chance of success as possible. Like I went to the mat on a daily basis, didn't take money out, spent every possible investor cent on growing that business and testing whether it would work or not. Realistically though, that just can't last. And it can't last for a couple of reasons. I mean, the main one I would go back to now is distraction. So I've never told anyone this, um, but in 20, 13, which was kind of the big primary year, I made more consulting revenue than I ever have, ever. And it was in the middle of a startup. So yay for me, but can you imagine what kind of distractions that introduced? Now, I consulted because I have a wife and two kids, so you can't just you know, dry up revenue. So I had no other opportunity, but I got extremely distracted by it. Very, very distracted. And it's at that stage where I had to have made that choice to burn the ships. I should have cut all that out, you know, save up, save up, save up, save up, cut. And I never cut it. Still doing the same kind of work today. Um, and I think that contributed to the distraction, which contributed to me not being um, scared enough to push the envelope. Yeah. If I'd had a co-founder, that never would have happened because they never would have let me do that. Yeah, that's debatable, but I agree. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things that we need to talk about now. So the first is, is we've talked a little bit about the fact that you use an outsource agency. So we need to kind of go into that because the numbers there are quite scary. Secondly, the co-founder issue, which I think is a major one. I mean, I'm a single founder and it's fucking hard because yeah. you're, it's a very lonely road. And then thirdly, the fact that you probably should have failed in the first six months and moved on with your life, right? And yep. instead you pushed it out for three years and did the best you could, but ultimately it didn't win out. And so now you've got to take that and go, okay, what would I do differently? Well, so should we go through those three points and then yeah. say, okay, what's next, what's different? I mean, and at this point, are there any questions, just to go through the first, the beginning? Please, don't be shy, guys. Seriously, yeah. you can ask any question you like. There's no right or wrong answer. No one's going to get criticized. If you have a burning thing that you need to ask, like how do I raise money or how do I get people to get off the fence and actually invest, then come and ask the question because between us, we've raised enough money to understand how this works. I think you're ahead on that scorecard. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it was just a question. The 500,000 that the angel investors put in, was that uh, loan capital that you have to pay back or was that actually 
no, equity. equity. So I would, I would never, at, at, at a seed stage of a business, I would never take on loan capital. I just don't think it's worth it. I think, you know, debt financing, loan capital, that's much, that's much more interesting when you're, when you're a mid-sized company and you're, you're scaling. Because you know you can pay it back and you can give whoever gives you that money a much safer investment. Now, it was flat equity. Um, there were a couple of interesting points uh, attached to it, which I suppose makes this an interesting question. One is um, there's always follow-on options and things like that. So I actually took 625000 um, because both investors had an option for an additional 5% each at original valuation. Okay? So Michael executed his option, um, and that was really to kind of give me some bridge financing um, because we had three fairly good merger deals which fell through right at the end. And that was when I finally kind of pulled the plug. Um, so it was 625 in total, but those options often get tagged on. So it's important to understand, and obviously, you know, an investor, if you're succeeding, they want to be able to double down at the original valuation so they get a discount. Um, and then I, I gave 1% to kind of my senior advisor uh, who helped me through the whole thing. And Angel Hub at the time had a 5% option. And they were, um, you're welcome to ask me about that. That was a fascinating relationship, which started off really badly and ended really well. Um, and uh, they, my investors wanted them on board to help manage the investment. And that also happens a little bit in this ecosystem because the angel investors are, they, are, they often have other businesses. Um, they're often in corporates. They often have their own startups. And they don't have time to nitty gritty manage their investments. And that's where players like Angel have started to add value to them, was that they, you know, they were the middleman for managing the investments and helping report back. Um, so does that answer your question? It was straight equity Just financing. another point in general, from my point of view, don't ever do loan cap. Yeah. in the early stages. Stay away from that as long as you possibly can. It's a bad instrument. Rather just go straight equity. If someone's not prepared to jump in the fire with you, fuck them. Yeah. They're not worth having on board. I wouldn't touch it. So just with Angel, Angel Hub, do you have to pay them a management fee? So, <laughs> is Brett here? No. No, he's no. flown back. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, I, uh, and I'll be completely honest about can it. I, can I just couch this quickly? Because I know yeah. what he's going to say, and I, I don't want him to feel bad about it. I've got no. VC investors, and I pay a two and a half grand a month in a management fee. It's part of the deal. You have to do it. Yeah. So, it, it's normal in most. So, they put you the money and they take it out there? Yeah. A, li a little bit. I mean, they've got costs as well. It's a little sneaky way. So, when, when Angel Hub started, I, mean, I fought them tooth and nail because I got that financing. I built the relationship with those investors, I did the pitching. Um, and then they were brought in against my will, and I didn't think I needed them. That's entrepreneur ego. Uh, I didn't want them, and I had to give away a potential 5% of my company, which at that stage you blindly believe is, is going to succeed. You have to blindly believe that. Um, and their first, their first proposal was a 15,000 rand a month management fee, and I told them to politely really? go fuck themselves. <laughs> sure. um, but yeah, again, they were, they were very young. Um, I was their first deal, I think, as well. Um, and that swiftly came down to two and a half thousand rand. Um, and you know what? Again, I fought a tooth and nail, and I hated it. At the end of the day, if I look back, I I couldn't have done what I did without them. It was enormously well spent because you know guys like Brett Kamal, you know he's been in the VC industry for a while. He knows about dilutions and cap tables and how to structure deals and management reports. I'd never seen a management report when I started this thing. You know, my management report template came from them. Uh, so they were extremely helpful. And I think it's a, a big lesson with startups is that you can't go it yourself. People can sometimes get so protective of equity that they don't allow themselves to be surrounded by, by lots of helpful people that have a vested little slice of interest in what you're doing. There's um, a principle here which I, a lot of my investors tell me is rather have a small piece of a big pie yeah. than a big piece of nothing. Right? And I think a lot of us try and protect that big piece of nothing to the end of the world, when actually 5% of a 30 million business is a hell of a lot bigger than 100% of a 2 million pound business. Yeah, and my last point on that... I think the math is right there, but yeah. yeah. My last point on that was, you know, when r right near the end, where we came to our, our biggest chance of a merger deal, um, and this was kind of when, this was the final gut punch that I had no air left, um, was, so we had we'd organized a big follow-on round, you know, almost six times as much as our angel round at a cracker valuation and we were going to merge into an existing e-commerce company, change the brand and go. Um, and 
it's like I'd never done a deal like that before. So having someone like Angelab on board is they knew what the documents needed to look like. They knew, you know, <laughs> they taught me the word EBITDA, <laughs> which I can now say proudly. <laughs> Don't ask me what it actually means. But, um, and so again, like just surrounding yourself with helpers is really, really important. You've obviously got to choose them carefully, but if you don't, it is just too lonely. You need, some, you need perspective to catch your fuck ups. And I think that's what, that's what they helped with a lot. Yep. Uh, hi, guys. Um, so your, your 500,000, 625, uh, you know, seed stage investment was based on a pre-money valuation of whatever it was. Pre-money, pre-product. Pre-product. Like, that shit so doesn't happen anymore. So what I want to know is how you got to that pre-money valuation, because it seemed to drive a lot of what you, what you got. <laughs> that. Okay. There's so a, how did you make it credible enough to an angel investor? So, you know, I look back at the, um, I, I'm, I'm doing some work with uh, Keith Jones and Odette at SW7, and um, I've done a couple of talks in it. They, they wanted to know what a pitch deck looks like. Um, and there's you know, plenty of examples uh, internationally, but like a local one that you can relate to. So I went back and I got the real-time wine pitch deck. And I was actually looking for like 1.8 million at a, for, for 20%. So that was like a valuation of about five and a half, I think. Um, and of course, you know, you start higher. But I'd say 50% of that answer is you take what you can get. Uh, and 50% of that answer is, you know, negotiation will just make it more realistic. So eventually, when and Michael, Michael was first in, and he said, okay, 250,000 for 10%. And I went, okay, <laughs> done. He then asked me to go and get match financing, which is another lesson which you guys will come across if you are raising financing. Often, angel investors don't want to be the only one in. They'll say, I'm in, hardly ever, but go find someone else. Yeah. Now, I landed him, okay, there was a bit of a relationship from, from F&B days, um, but I landed him in one meeting and one glass of wine. Um, it took me another three months to find someone else. Uh, and that's where kind of, from start to finish of the funding cycle was about eight months. And Angel had told me at that stage that that was pretty damn quick. I think we're probably around six months now in South Africa, but that's a lot longer than your head expects. Fundraising is slow, 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 slow. I just want to add to that point quickly for, from my perspective. I think, and you know, I've, I've been through a bit more than Andy, so I really want this to help you guys. If you can't raise enough money for 18 months, do not raise the money. Yep. Right? Walk away. Just walk away and do something else where you can raise the kind of money. Because I've done this and he's done this and basically you don't raise enough money to start. Okay? So within six months you're raising again. Okay? And then hell's bells, you've set a trend and now you can't raise enough. So a year down the track you're raising again. Now if you do the maths and it takes you three to six months to do each raise, for the last three years that I've been running my company, I've probably raised money for nine months of that period, if not longer where I'm not focused on the business. I'm focused on getting people to sign checks, right? That's incredibly distracting. So I'm kind of of the viewpoint, having been through what I've been through, that in the future, given the opportunity to do this again, I will not raise money unless I can raise enough for a small team to execute for 18 months. Because that's how long it takes to make traction. And if I, if I can't achieve that traction in 18 months, I will not look for more funding. I'll walk away and go, sorry guys, it didn't work but I will burn everything that I can to make sure we hit that point, right? So the point here is, is that fundraising in the early stages is not an, a, a science, right? There's no ways you can build a spreadsheet that says this is how much you should raise and this is what it's worth. It's actually art more than anything else. And it's a lot to do with what the market's doing, how much money the angel investor has, how big they think an exit might be, how much equity they, they're prepared to, to work with, how much they think you need to have, and then how well you can articulate why you need that cash. So don't think that there's a strategy behind this. It's actually a whole bunch of different factors. And the key thing you have to achieve is enough money to give you enough runway. And if you're a single founder, 18 months of burn is a hell of a lot cheaper than a 10 person team, right? So each business or each product is going to have its own kind of nuances. And you need to understand that before you start and raise enough to make traction. And that's it. Okay. And if no one's going to believe you, fuck them. Move on, right? Don't get hung up on it. Understanding the mechanics of that mass um, is, is kind of important. So an angel investor in the US and the UK will probably look for a 10x return. Um, you know, that's kind of what they target. Sometimes you get a thousand X and sometimes you get nothing. Um, so let's, you know, let's, we're, we're, we're a young ecosystem. Let's say a 5x return. Let's try to figure out what that means for a business like Real Time Wine. Okay, if I want to give my investors 5x, okay, I've got to give them 1.2 million back on their 200. 
which means I've got to sell that company for like 15 to 20 million rand. You know, when did an app last get bought for 15 to 20 million rand? Kind of, it forces you to think big. <laughs> you know, the app was too small. I needed to think much bigger. Now the whole B2B play, plugging into retailers, all that kind of thing, that was a bit bigger, but probably still not big enough. Uh, so it's really useful to do that maths before you start raising. Just back to actually raising funds. Uh, I think there's a general feeling, uh, well, certainly amongst in the Cape, Cape Town uh, environment, uh, guys looking for investment, that uh, VCs l tend to look more at the people uh, who are asking for the money than the businesses. And I'll tie it back to what you said about Michael Jordan now. I've never met Michael Jordan. You worked with him for a couple of years at FNB and did some pretty Im impressive stuff while you were there. If that was me sitting at the table with Michael Jordan asking for money for a real-time wine, would I have got it? Uh, so you would have got filtered a lot more by s someone like, you know, like, like Brett from Angel Hub, who now works with Michael. Um, so I don't think my pitch deck ever actually got read. I really don't. <laughs> um, I, think they, I think they bought the person and they bought the, they bought the passion. You know, wine was a passion for both those investors. It was a passion for me. Um, that's what they bought. If you were sitting there, you would have had to go through a lot more filtering. And then I think this idea that it was, it was a bit of a miracle that I raised pre-money, pre-product. That doesn't really happen anymore. You know, we need to knock this idea out of our heads that you can just run around with an idea and raise money. Okay? We think Silicon Valley is just, you know, they just throw money at people. They don't. The guys who are raising money in the valley have fully developed products, fully developed team, users, often millions of them, With before traction. they even raise angel. Yeah. They have to do a huge amount of work to raise money. And that's why they're raising so big, because they've de-risked the idea. You know, I came and I was like, oh, I've got this cool idea, man, for like TripAdvisor for wine, and there's some cool stuff around moment of consumption. Um, so you know, on that basis, 2.5 post-money valuation was a miracle. Uh, we need to, we're, we're a bit lazy in our early stage of this ecosystem. We need to work harder and but be more I want to be a little bit contrarian because I think you're searching for a different answer. I, I think that, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial here, right? Every single point in time that I can tie back for me that has created any measure of success has come through a personal relationship that I spent a long time developing before anything happened, right? So my very first investor in my last company, I knew him for two years. My big VC in my current company, I did due diligence for him on three deals before he even got to know me, right? So I established tech credibility in those due diligence projects long, 18 months before he invested in me. So I'd, I'd invested four years in that relationship before I even went to him and said, look, I'm raising cash. How many of you guys are doing that here, right? It's, you don't just walk up to someone and say, hey, I want to raise some money. You've got to build a relationship. And that's why you've got to come to events like this, because you're going to meet someone like Brett, you're going to build a relationship, and then two years later, you're going to say, hey, Here's my deck, here's my traction, here's my product, here's my team. You've known me for two years. I've done everything I said I was going to do. Rule number one, keep your promises. Let's do a deal. Yeah. That's how you raise money. You don't raise money by pitching up with a deck where, where, where no one knows you and, and, and then get frustrated because the guy doesn't want to invest because you're an unknown quantity. You have to establish credibility. So I would be a little bit contrarian here and say you've got to do everything you can to build that relationship long in advance before you go raise money because otherwise it's incredibly fucking hard. And I, think just I don't on think the, on that's the contrary. I think that's the ticket to the ballpark. Well, I think everybody has a different view of that here, right? And no one really wants to face the truth. And that's that you've got to work hard. Right? I think that people have this idea that raising money in Silicon Valley is easy. Guess what, guys? It's fucking hard. Right? The number of people in the Valley that are trying to raise money at even any given point in time is probably 50x what it is here. And those guys are competing with the best engineers in the world, with the most amount, amount of money in the world. Right? It's not easy. So the only way you're going to get into that meeting is if you've got the deck, if you've got traction, if you've got a product, if you've got a relationship, and you've got an in. That's how you get there. Right? And that takes work. So I ask you again, how many people are doing that now before they go and try and raise money? Probably 2%. So I'm working with a... So I have no sympathy for those people who say that raising money is hard when they haven't put in the hard yards. Because guess what? It's hard, right? That's it. I'm working with this company in, uh, in Kenya, um, just a consulting gig. It's a really interesting startup called Intern It Up, um, which matches graduates with internship opportunities. And we're hopefully about to close a funding round. And it has been 10 times harder because 
of creating the deck, creating the business plan, creating the model, having the model picked apart by the VC, having to make sure you don't look like an idiot while it's picked apart and you're fixing it. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of work. That took me a, pretty much a full month of slog um, to get that deal to where it is now at, at, at term sheet stage. Hey Andy, uh, just maybe take it in a slightly different direction. Yeah. Um, all those uh, business models that you mentioned, yeah. they all rely on having uh, some consumer traction. So uh, at the moment we've addressed the issue that you feel like you didn't have enough cash. What was the big plan to get cons consumers to adopt the application? Because I can't see the thing working until you get to that point. So, I mean, here was... Good question. Great question. Thanks, Elan. Um, <laughs> Here was one of the, the, the most interesting stories of that startup, and it's, it's on two fronts. So one is kind of the PR side of it, and, and one is the actual traction that we, we received. So Real Time Wine was... And sorry, just before, talk about the vanity metrics. You've got to talk about the vanity metrics. Yeah, okay. So Real Time Wine was, was kind of a runaway PR success story. We had enormous amounts of coverage. I mean, when this thing was still in testing phase, when it was a, a blog where I was you know, tweeting about wine and then just pasting it onto blog to see what would happen, we got a full page in the Sunday Times. I mean, you can't buy that kind of publicity. By the end of it, we probably had more than 100 you know, dedicated articles written about us. Some of that had to do with the fact that I have some friends in the journalism industry and, and they were very, very supportive and you know, I, I owe them big time for that. Um, but a lot of it was because it was just an amazing story. And I think some of the problem was I started to get very deluded with the PR success as opposed to the actual numerical revenue success of the startup. And you've got to be very careful there. PR helps you craft your story. It does not necessarily drive revenue. Um, so that was kind of on the one front. And I suppose, you know, vanity metrics is a is a sign of that. Let me just remember what I'm going to say on... You're distracting me, Gareth. <laughs> but, uh, we've got to remember oh, to actual answer traction. So, Elon's question, right? Yeah, so let me answer plan to actually get traction? Okay, let me answer part two of, of that question. Is I also got distracted because we had enormous amounts of traction. Um, we had, in a year or, or so, about... So, okay, across the products, beer and wine, we had 30,000 consumer reviews of products. Okay, that's never been done before in this country, ever. Actual everyday consumers taking the time to write something about a product they consume. We had 60 or 70,000 ratings. It's like quantitative ratings. The yum, hmm, yuck. You know, uh, that, that, that. Uh, and, you know, the numbers that you could look at, they were just like this, okay? So there was, a, there was a lot of traction. It was just maybe the wrong kind of traction. It was, it was product traction and user traction from a small group of hyper-engaged users, whereas it wasn't particular revenue traction. But then there was some revenue traction. I mean, we turned a million rand. That's not enormous, but it's not nothing. Um, and we spent all of that back on you know, marketing and product developments and, and all those kind of things. And I think one of the things which screwed me was, was this vanity metric. So there we go. We've segued nicely. Um, so who's read The Lean Startup? That just is just, not you, enough. Let's do it. We didn't Cape Town quickly. Just, yeah, yeah. Okay. So who's read The Lean Startup? Put your hands up. All right. Who's read The Hard Thing About Hard Things? No one. Okay. One Two. guy. Okay. Uh, what does the other one? Does The oh. Lean Startup... Hard thing about hard things? I don't know. There's one other one. There's innovator's dilemma. There's what got you here won't, got, won't get you there. Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's two I books you need to runs. read, right? So <laughs> when you walk out of here, go, go to the bookstore, go to Amazon, whatever you do. There's two books. One is Lean Startup. Okay, you have to read that cover to cover before you start anything. And the second thing you should do is read The Hard Thing About Hard Things by a guy called Ben Horowitz. And that will help you understand what it's like before you start. And if after reading the Lean Startup and reading the hard things, you still feel like you want to go ahead, go for it. But at that point, know that you have the knowledge and the, the theoretical kind of understanding of what you're getting yourself into before you get started. So the, the Lean Startup, I had this beautiful and slightly embarrassing moment. So um, vanity metrics, right? Yeah. yeah. That was you know, half th halfway three quarters into the startup journey. And I read the Lean Startup, and I, I kind of stopped, and I went, 
because I'd pretty much committed almost every crime they talk about in that book, unwittingly. And I, so, just to explain this, so his graphs are doing this, right? Every investor loves up and to the right, right? Those are the graphs you want to show people. The problem yeah. is, is that those graphs were for the wrong metrics. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, what the book defines as vanity metrics is, you know, I looked at my management reports and, you know, freaking Angel Hub owes me a beer for not picking this up. <laughs> but anyway, so I looked at my management reports and they were all vanity metrics. So a vanity metric would be anything that is cumulative. Okay? So number of downloads, number of users, number of reviews. And there's this beautiful thing about cumulative graphs. Okay? They always go up and towards the right. <laughs> Full stop. And if you want to make them look sexier, you squish them like this. Or you and then the line goes months. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at these reports, I was like, oh, crap. They're all vanity. And then I started in introducing what that book is uh, calls actionable metrics. And these are the tough ones, because actionable metrics kind of bear your soul to the world. And suddenly, everything isn't as rosy as you'd like it to but be. Let's just give some examples. So an actionable so metric would be daily downloads, right? Daily downloads. Instead of cumulative downloads. Yeah. Active users instead yeah. of registered users. Monthly churn, right? How attrition many people rates, attrition, yeah. yeah. Those kind of things. Now, when Page I'm, speed. When I, um, when I measured active users, for instance, okay, and you know, I, I've got this other minor saying, Aaron doesn't have to be the only guy who can uh, have quotes. That entrepreneurship is the, the art of continually trying to not delude yourself. Um, so here's a great example of me deluding myself, is that I measured active users, okay, and active users were like, um, so real-time wine had, at, the, at that stage, about 4,000 users, it ended on about six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 users. So 4,000 users odd at that stage, um, active users was about 400. Okay? And I was like, okay, but don't worry, that, that, that totally fits because the social engagement ratio is 1, 9, 90. So 90% of people lurk, 9% of people contribute, and 1% of people create. And then I flipped it around and I was like, aha, no, I'm even better because you know, instead of 1% of people creating, I've got 10% of people creating because an active user I defined as someone who was earning points, which means they were contributing content. And so I was like, ah, then it's, it's, it's absolutely fine. What I didn't pick up, because I didn't interpret the actionable metric properly, is that if you have 400 active users for eight months, okay, and it's 400 users every month for eight months, what does that tell you? It's either the same people, or even worse, you're doing a really good job of getting new people on, and they're not staying. That's worse. That's way worse. And I, I think that's what, ha what that was happening. I had about 200 users who were hyper users. Okay, they, they were like, geez, if, you know, if you could build a business on 200 true friends, I'd be a gazillionaire by now. And then every month I'd bring 200 new people on and they'd stay for a month and then they'd go. And I didn't pick that up quick enough. So key point there is actionable metrics. Question. No. Oh, okay, great. Thank you guys. Um, just a quick question. Um, in your own opinion, being an entrepreneur um, and obviously having a, a, a tech startup, um, generally speaking, um, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's lonely. When does one? When must one learn to to give up? You know, if you're trying and you you're starting a new business, and you believe in it and you're passionate about it, but things are you know things are just not working. Um, do you keep on persisting and, and keep on trying? Where do you draw the line and say, you know what? I think this is not going to work out for me. That's a really, it's a really, really good question. Um, so I, I'll give you two perspectives to that, and you probably have a story or two as well. I think I, I think I gave up too late. I think I kept pushing for way, way too long, um, because pretty much the last eight months of that startup was slow death. I, I knew it was dying, I, and I was doing Hail Marys. It was like, Hail Mary this deal, Hail Mary that deal, running around to as many investors as I could, trying to raise like a big chunk of money so I could actually do something, because I just built e-commerce from scratch. Um, and slow death is the worst. You know, you start preaching fail fast, and then you take eight months to slowly die. Um, that's not cool, and I will really try and avoid making that mistake again. But I think when I finally pulled the plug was, I, I did it for relationships. I didn't want to burn the bridges of the people that had supported me, so I felt that I had to do absolutely everything in my power to turn over every single stone that I could. And when I felt that I'd done that, and kind of that third and final deal fell through, I was like, okay, that's it. Done. And pulled the plug. Yeah, so I mean, my perspective on that's very similar. I think, you know, I, I believe that in life, 
there's two things which you want to protect. The one is how you value your time, and the other is how you value your reputation. Because once you lose your reputation, you lose a lot. Uh, and it takes a lifetime to build a reputation, but it takes five minutes to kill it. Um, so for me, it's super important to protect the money and the investment and the time that the people around me have put into what I'm doing. So I'm adamant that I won't quit until I've reached that point where I can't see any way out. I have to do everything I possibly can. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in London uh, 2011, and I helped a guy build an e-commerce subscription business. We built his website for him. This is when I was still farting around. And um, we built the first site for him, and he went out and raised $19 million in a period of 18 months. And six months after that, he shut the business down and did a fire sale and walked away, went back to Germany. I can't do that. Right? Because effectively I'm saying to my investors, I don't give a shit. I'm going to do what's right for me. And I think that if you want to build that credibility and you want to build that reputation, you've got to do what's right for the people that are around you. So that's the first thing. At the same time, you have to recognize that at some point you're going to hit a wall. And you just mm -hmm. can't go any further. And you've got to be really honest with yourself about what that point is. And you've got to be really clear about what that point is. Otherwise, you're going to start doing Hail Marys. And then you're never going to get there and it's going to get long and drawn out. And, you know, and I think as I get older and as I get a bit more experienced, I know where that point is a lot quicker, and I'm prepared to accept that I might reach that point, and if I do, I've got to pull back. But I also think that, you know, Aaron brought up that point earlier in his talk. Many startups, most startups don't die because they stop typing. They die because they give up. It's effectively suicide. And I think in general, if you don't give up, it's at the point where you think you're going to fail, and where everything looks like it's going to fail, that actually you turn it around, because you've kept going. Mm. So it's a very, very hard question to answer, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for anybody. I but think basically, I way. think you've got to do is act with dignity, and, and, and live a life of... Um, just respect. Just respect. <laughs> if one you do that, you, you know, you'll be fine. There's one way to measure it, is um, alcohol units per day. And the minute you see your alcohol units per day is starting to do this. It's actually <laughs> funny. So I, 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 um, I, I've just got married recently, and um, I, you know, I don't do drugs. I don't really drink that much. Uh, my weakness is ice cream. So when I have a particularly bad day, I go home and I smash Haagen-Dazs Belgian, Belgian chocolate. Like that, that's my poison. And I probably go through two of those a week at the moment. Um, and <laughs> Everyone know, has advice. I mean, yeah. You've got to measure that kind of stuff because... Uh, yeah, especially in the wine and beer business. If you're getting high on your own supply, it's probably a bad sign. Probably a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. We've got a great business. We're selling lots of wine. No, you're, not. you're drinking it. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, earlier on, you said that one of your revenue models was to sell the data. But if research companies were interested, why couldn't they use it? I, so I, I don't think it was that they couldn't use it. I mean, some of that data was, was really, really fascinating. Um, it was that there wasn't really anyone who would buy it. You know, that was the big problem. You know, all the research companies, and I met with the two big ones, and they were like, oh, this is amazing. They couldn't sell it to anyone because no one would buy it. And some of the reason no one would buy it is because people probably don't know what to do with it. You know, or they they're say, not equipped to do anything with or it. Or they're not equipped. You know, so they say data, you know, big data is the new oil. Sure. But you can only sell it to someone who knows how to turn oil into petrol. And that was probably something I could have tested first, instead of failing at the sale. Um, so just to, 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 like, I think this is really important, because yeah. we're running out of time, but there's two things we've got to get into. One is outsource versus insource. We haven't really dealt with that yet. And I think that that was probably your biggest mistake, in fairness, because it cost you the most amount of money. And secondly, I think if you had figured out up front that there was a person willing to buy that data, before you started, you would have had a market of one when you started, and that might have made it easier to either MVP it or not. Well, it's this idea of testing assumptions. Yeah. So again, one of my oh fuck lean startup moments was that in the book, the book teaches you to write down your assumptions, and you've got to be really, really honest. Like no, bu no bullshit kind of write down your assumptions. And so, you know, my first assumption was uh, people want to talk about wine, okay? And that was like, okay, no, but, you know, traction, tick. People care enough to actually change their behavior. Oops. <laughs> that assumption proved wrong. Uh, I can collect data on wine. Tick. People will buy said data. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and that's kind of how it goes. Um, and, and testing your assumptions and testing your market before you raise or launch or build is really, really important. You need to understand this idea of, 
of, yeah. of market validation. Um, should we take a question and see, and see what yeah. we can fit in? Sorry, I just want to ask about Don't marketing. apologize. It's okay. <laughs> um, you, you spoke earlier about getting good PR, but you didn't speak about marketing itself. So you can build a, a, a fantastic product, but we all know taking it to market is, um, is pretty difficult, and uh, it costs a lot of money. You, you're competing in the space, the sort of advertising space of the big boys, so all advertising space is expensive. So how did you do that, and what would you have done differently? OK, great question. Um, so I'll answer a couple of ways. I didn't have enough money to do enough marketing. Um, I had to you know, do what I could with what I had. Over the life of the startup, I spent 70,000 Rand on marketing. Um, if the raise for the startup I'm helping out goes through, they're going to be spending the equivalent of like 40,000 Rand a month on marketing. And that's you know, lesson learned. Um, I did do some pretty cool stuff. Facebook app install ads are amazing. Um, jump on them now before it gets really expensive. I was pulling in downloads at 3 Rand 50 a download. Uh, that was you know, that was really really cheap. I just didn't have the three million rand to throw at it, so that I could just eat up the market. But then, you know, the more important thing is, I got the market sizing wrong. Um, and you know, I did I did a whole bunch of clever marketing things. There was direct emailers, and there was viral this, and there was share that. And I, I pretty much you know go through the quirky marketing textbook. I ticked every single chapter, and I did all of those tactics, and many of them worked. But the basic market sizing was again, where I probably deluded myself a little. And in hindsight, I can do this really cool exercise. So I go, OK, um, smartphones in South Africa, say 10 million. Okay? Uh, smartphones that are app active, because okay? a lot of smartphones are just used to send SMSs. Like 5 million. Okay? People who drink wine who have app active smartphones, uh, 2.5 million. <laughs> People who drink wine, who have app-active smartphones, who will change behavior. <laughs> and it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time you finish, you've probably got an addressable market of like 200,000 people. Now, you and know, I've got a couple of percent you're getting of 200 of those 200,000 people a month, right? So that's 1% of your addressable market or actually less. So I was kicking ass. Yeah, so he was kicking ass. <laughs> but the market, market was, just too, was too small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really sucky uh, American term called growth hacking. Um, but it's worth Googling because the Americans are starting to really embrace the science of how to grow users. And it really is a science. And it just requires dedication. It requires painfully and manually testing every single channel that you can, finding the ones that work. And once you've found them, double, du doubling down on them. Yeah. Does that well, answer your question? Cool. We've got to start wrapping up for the next talk. So what I'd suggest is if you want to speak to Andy, he's a, he's a good guy. He'll answer any of your questions. Um, totally. Has this been useful? Yes. Is there any last thing that you want? Just a one word answer. Oh, sorry, no, I just wanted to know about the insourcing and outsourcing because you mentioned it a couple of times. Okay, so let's, let's do it quick, quick. Very quick. Okay. Um, so sure, it might have been my biggest mistake, but I didn't have another option. Yeah. I mean, we've ascertained that I couldn't have afforded a dev team. But I'm not beating on you, right? No, no. I think these guys need to know it, because I think they're in the same position. Yeah. Right? So I had no other option but to outsource. Okay? Now, I see three options with outsourcing. One is small agency, one is big agency, uh, and one is India. Okay? And in small agency, you can group single freelance developers and, and things like that. I only have one thing to say about small agencies. Okay? Money talks, equity walks. Okay? You know, if that guy, is, or guy or girl is paying their bills and a bigger client comes in with more money than you and you have no money because you're a startup, your stuff is going to be deprioritized. So you have to realize that. Okay? Go in with both, both eyes open. Big agency, if you can afford a big agency, you should be hiring a team. You know, when, when I was getting quotes back in 2012, a native app, which we weren't, was about 500,000 Rand per platform. Now agencies will hit you about a bar per platform. Okay, with that kind of money, you can afford your own team. However, you know, I pulled a lot of favors, pulled a lot of strings, um, did a lot of negotiation, and I managed to get a medium to big size agency, which Presence was, they were 40 plus people, um, to do it at kind of the cost of what a small agency would have paid. I burnt my entire favor bank. Um, and the big lesson from that is twofold. One is that the, the benefit of an agency is that you're guaranteed a product because you have a contract. You're just not guaranteed a time frame. Um, so it took them, you know, took them a year to fix all the bugs. It was just way, way, way too long. 
It was a weird experience. The first part of the experience was amazing. The second part was terrible. Um, and I think the second part is that big agencies are just not structured to, to iterate. And the whole fundamental thing of what we've been talking about in the startup world is quick iteration. You need to move quickly. And an agency isn't structured to do that simply because of the way they bill. You know, it's not their fault. It's just the way they're structured, the way they build, the way they interact with clients. And their clients, their paying clients, are big corporates that value de-risking a project over mitigating risk over, over speed. Um, and I think you know, that probably came back to bite me. Still, you know, if you want to sum it up, we built a fairly amazing product. We made some technical errors. You can ask me about that later. Um, we built a fairly amazing product on a shoestring budget. Remember that 500K was paid in two tranches. So I had 250, you had to hit a whole bunch of milestones, then I had another 250. Um, we got a whole bunch of market traction. We just suffered a lot of the South African things, which is why we're talking about this. This is market size, not thinking big enough, and a couple of other things. So just to summarize, what you want in an ideal team is a hustler, a coder, you want to have your first product out in three months. You want to read MVP and the hard thing about hard things. And you want to iterate like mad so that when you go and see an investor, you've got a deck, a product, you've got traction, and you've made and ideally mistakes. some revenue, yeah. and you've made some mistakes that you can point to. And if you can do all of those things, you don't need a team of external people. You've got your own team, yeah. right? And you should only ever hire as you need people. And that's the ideal way to get cracking. That's it.